Ken Saro Wiwa, writer and activist in Nigeria, executed in 1995 after standing up against oil companies, pushing for equal rights for the people in the Niger Delta. Now, almost 20 years later, Ken Saro Wiwa's family and the Ogoni speak out. It's amazing how he's, he's put uh, Ogoni land on the map. He made the invisible visible. never imagined <laughs> this and I never imagined that even 20 years later the thing would still be so painful as if it happened yesterday. The older I get the, the more um, I really appreciate my father's bravery. Um, you know you're aware of these things at 19. It's, it's almost like yesterday, first of all, that's uh, each time Ken Sarua's name is mentioned or as a reference to the Ogoni, you know, people there, new leadership, etc. I just have the image of Ken before me. Bane, a village in the heart of Nigeria's Niger Delta. This house has the grave of writer and activist Ken Saro Wiwa, who was executed by the Nigerian military government in 1995. A mile away, there is still his house, next to the one of his mother. Ken Saro Wiwa was born in 1941 in nearby Bori as the son of Chief Jim Wiwa and his wife, Jessie. We are in Ogoniland, in the Niger Delta. With its 650 square kilometers, it is the size of Greater London. Here live the Ogoni, a minority of 500,000 people marginalized by the ruling ethnic groups in Nigeria, being the Yoruba, the Hausa Fulani, and the Igbo. Ken Sarowiwa comes from the Ogoni community. Their minority position made it easy for the government to start oil exploration through joint ventures with mainly Shell. When Ken was 17, he all of a sudden saw pipelines emerging, gas flares, and oil spills. This disturbance made him angry and he started sending protest letters to newspapers. This ignited Ken's interest in writing, and he wanted to go and study English, but was halted by the Biafra War, which raged in the Niger Delta from 1967 until 1970. Then, using his wits, Ken Sarowiwa became an administrator for the local government, but got fired because of raising attention for the oil companies exploiting his Ogoni land. Then, to make his daily bread, he ended up in real estate in Port Harcourt. He was forced into business, which is not something he had any natural appetite for. And uh, he became a moderately successful businessman. Um, and, he, and he could have been much more successful because he was, he was close to all of the Nigeria's rulers and the elites at that time. And he could have used those advantages, but he, for reasons best known to himself, he didn't. The turnaround for Ken Sarowiwa came in the 1990s when again, desperate for income, he started producing the sitcom Bassi and Company, using the experience he acquired from having produced radio plays earlier on. It was a parody on the corrupt Nigerian society and is still the best viewed television show in Nigeria ever. You want to be a millionaire? Like a millionaire, act like a millionaire, you have to be your. 
once he'd made a little bit of money, he now started writing, you know, he took up the pen again, he started writing a column in newspapers and, it, and things were beginning to pick up again. In his new books, he criticized the corrupt government and his concern about minorities like the Ogoni. But despite the changing fortune, his son Ken says his father was unhappy. He felt frustrated because, you know, he wasn't published outside of Nigeria. He had to self-publish um, and his ideas were not getting much traction, you know, even though 30 million people were watching Bassi and Company and even though he was writing a column in the Sunday Times and um, in Punch and Vanguard. Bad luck shifted his trajectory indefinitely. When he lost a manuscript of a novel that he, he, he had written, which he wanted to use to introduce to a wider audience outside. He was hoping it would be published outside of Nigeria, and then from there he could then probably sort of start introducing his politics. Uh, he lost the novel, he just felt, okay, maybe he was not meant to be a writer. And, and then he now became a, an environmental activist, and he realized that what, he was, what he'd been all this time was actually an environmental activist. Almost like being reborn, Ken Saro Wiwa took on the oil industry because none of the millions of petrol dollars flowed back into Ogoniland, with its lack of schools and hospitals. This had Ken co-founding MOSOP, the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people. And in 1990, they presented to the government their demands in the Ogoni Bill of Rights. Do you know the meaning of most of the movement for the survival of the people? Do you know the meaning of most of the movement for the survival of the people? Do you know the meaning of most of the movement for the survival of the people? Do you know the meaning of most of the movement for the survival of the people? Ken Saru Wiwa first had shown the Ogoni Bill of Rights to writer Wole Shoyinka who is the 1986 winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. Ken Jr., then 14 years old, remembers he gladly joined, but wasn't aware that his father was going to present the Ogoni Bill of Rights. My father never wasted an opportunity to start talking about the Ogoni issue. So there I was saying, ah, here he is talking about this thing again. And I just said, look, can't, I wanted him to finish his business, let me talk to my, <laughs> my, my father's hero. Well, I remember when I was around, I think maybe 12 or 13, he um, showed us this book and it was called The Agoni Bill of Rights. And uh, obviously at that age, it meant nothing to me. It was just a very boring political uh, document, but uh, he was really passionate about it. Oh, they've done their homework and they'd also done their future, their plan for the future of the Ogoni people. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't um, a kind of declaration which was long on ideology, no, it is a kind of uh, ethnic view at uh, an uncomfortable association, but based on the principles of justice uh, and also on the um, unequal distribution of resources of the nation, especially oil. Ken Saru Wiwa started to sacrifice more and more time for the Ogoni issue. His children noticed it began to overtake him. When, whenever we went down to the village to see our grandparents, uh, on the way to the village, he would point out all the gas flares and, and, uh, and the environmental degradation. And again, you know, we would look and nod and, you know, not think very much of it. But, you know, he was really fired up about this, very angry about it. And, uh, and so that's when, you know, things started to change. And you'd hear him on the phone uh, talking to friends and, and colleagues and was constantly uh, talking about oil and pollution and, and government corruption. In my late teens, I was very aware that he had become obsessed by this issue. Um, he, didn't, he, he didn't talk about anything else. People would come to the house and that's what they will be talking about. When the government didn't respond to the Ogoni Bill of Rights, Mosop summoned the oil companies to pay royalties to the Ogoni or otherwise leave. When again there was no response, Mosop called for a mass demonstration. 
And on January 4th in 1993, 300,000 Ogoni took to the streets. That day, what my father had achieved in, in two, three years is that it's, he'd managed to get everybody, the community, the collective had found their voice and their identity and their pride back. And, and he always said that that was his greatest achievement. And, and he wrote that if he died that day, he would have died a happy man. As a result of the protest, the unthinkable happened. A giant-like shell discontinued its million-dollar operation in Ogoniland. Ken Saruwiwa was arrested for having caused civil unrest, but was released after one month. Then, in 1994 in Ogoniland, a group of elders was murdered by unknown assailants and Ken Saruwiwa was arrested again and brought before a military tribunal and then Nigerian dictator Sani Abacha ordered his execution, which at the time was usual against anyone standing up against the state. This took place in the Port Harcourt prison on the 10th of November, 1995. Only two and a half years after the great demonstration of 1993. Alfred Iler is a member of MOSO. At the time of Ken's execution, he was in the same Port Harcourt prison for having campaigned against the government. Alfred, from his cell, could hear the statement Ken Sarowiwa made before he was brought to the gallows. He said, what sort of country is this that delights in the killing of its illustrious citizens? What have I done to deserve death? All of that, I spoke the truth and speaking for the rights of my people. If it be that by my death, my people can be free, Lord, allow me to die. Take my soul, but the struggle continues. The execution of Ken Saruwiwa was condemned by the national and the international community. By then, he was already internationally famous because of Shell's pullout of Ogoniland and his courage to stand up against the military rulers. I said yesterday that I thought this was a fraudulent trial, a bad verdict, an unjust sentence, and it has now been followed by judicial murder. I think in Africa, uh, are full of disgust at, at what has happened. And it, it is uh, not only horrifying, but utter disrespect for all of us who have tried to assist Nigeria to come out of this um, uh, situation, difficult situation in which it finds itself. Saro Wiwa's son, Ken Jr., together with Nobel Prize laureate Wole Shoyinka, were at a Commonwealth summit in New Zealand to lobby against the execution of his father and for the Ogoni case. But the execution came too unexpected. Ken was asleep in a hotel and was woken up by a friend. And so when I heard a knock on the door around 5 a.m., 4 or 5 a.m., it was, you know, it was dawn because I could hear the birds now singing and uh, a little bit, a few cars going past my window. And Richard, Richard Bula, this uh, Australian activist who's been with us all this for months and been with me, you know, been my sort of guide throughout uh, that period. I opened the door and he was there and I could see it on his face, you know. And, um, and he just told me and I just turned around and started just absentmindedly getting dressed, you know. So you're just still pushing the thing away, just very business-like, I've got to pack my clothes, I have to leave. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't even think about where I was going. I think whatever he was saying about flights, it just didn't, I just wasn't listening. So I was, uh, I was still at university, I was uh, shopping, I went out um, uh, to central London um, and bought some food. Uh, in those days there was no uh, there weren't any mobile phones, um, and so I was away from my house all day. I came back about seven o'clock in the evening and uh, my flatmate uh, left a, a note saying I should call my mother. Uh, and that's when I knew um, 
something had happened. Uh, so I, I called my mother and then she told me. Uh, and so I, I then took a, a train uh, back to my mother's house. I knew in my heart of hearts that I knew, I knew about you. I'd studied about you and I'd studied, uh, in addition to everything else, he, he was a natural born sadist if such beings exist. And um, I, I knew that if some stern warning was not given from the Commonwealth as a state, um, uh, he was going to carry out those executions. So I had, like Ken did, a really powerful sense of desperation. The execution had Nigeria expelled from the Commonwealth for three years, and it sent a shockwave through Ogoniland. Oh, it galvanized the Ogoni people, you know, to, uh, to further their original aspirations. One thing it did not do was discourage um, a continuation of the struggle, although it was being, you know, being prosecuted now in different, different ways. <laughs> Now, almost 20 years after Ken's execution, there is still no oil extraction in Ogoniland. From these wells, there is no oil flowing anymore to the pipelines that used to be there. But there is still the Trans-Niger pipeline transporting 150,000 barrels of oil per day from other oil fields. This 50-year-old pipeline occasionally breaks and the leaked crude turned the wetlands into cinematic black and white scenery. And a few miles away, crude oil is floating in ponds amidst the maize and cassava fields. Norkai Deko, a 40-year-old farmer and mother of three, says it affects her badly. <laughs> The leader of a local council in Ogoniland notices these complaints across the region. You suffer the impact because of our lands, our waterways, our stream, our creek are affected, highly contaminated. Shell always maintained that these spills are caused by sabotage. According to Charles Koya of a local development group, it's true that poor youth come to break pipelines hoping to sell crude, but he says that they are sent by the army groups guarding the delta. There is that arrangement of them calling and inviting the community boys to come and help to break the pipeline so that they sell the oil for them. So when the community boys come and break the pipeline, then they, be then they become their boys who, when they said the, 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 the export, the, the proceeds from the, from the leakage will now go to the security people and the military people. This ongoing pollution of Ogoniland makes that Ken Sarowiwa was not forgotten. His remains after the execution finally came home in 2005, when the Nigerian government released his body to be reburied in Bane. His 38-year-old daughter, New Saro Wiwa has vivid memories. Yeah, we reassembled his skeleton and, and we put some of his personal effects uh, with him in the coffin, so his pipe and uh, his books, things like that. And uh, yeah, it was, it was traumatic at first. You know, we were crying and one of my sisters was screaming, but uh, after a while, you know, you get used to it and, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's our father, it's not a macabre set of bones. Cousin Harry Wiwa, who lives in Bane, says that still many people come and visit. I would say that every November 10th of every other year, people come to Bane here and visit this family and the gravesite where they pay their respect to their hero. 
and uh, students on uh, research do come here time without number from various institutions. In Port Harcourt on 24 Agri Road, there is still his office that is turned into a private museum by the family. Sami Falana is the custodian. A lot of people hold him to be our hero because we have not seen that kind of a vocal and bold leader that comes out, abandon property, abandon money, family, only to you know, lay his life for some of us to speak out. You know, and that is why we take him so very serious. Ken's Mosop is also still there. Lekborsi Piakbara is the president and he says that Ken's legacy is alive. I don't think there's any uh, organic child growing up that uh, don't talk about Ken Saro even to this day, even when they were not born when he was a kid. And uh, to the average Ogoni person, the memory of Ken Saro will continue, I mean, to ring, especially when some of the issues he raised, almost, not some, almost all the issues he raised about the Ogoni people, about the Nigeria state, is coming to be the issues that are occupying current discourses at the moment. A highlight for Mosop was the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, coming to Ogoniland for an assessment. The 2011 findings show toxic contamination of drinking water, widespread degradation of mangrove forests, pollution of farmlands, all because of oil spills over decades. The UNEP concludes that restoring the environment would require the biggest cleanup operation ever. Taking 30 years at an initial cost of $1 billion. For the Ogoni, this is the ultimate proof that Ken Saruwiwa was right. Today we have a scientific study that are proving that the claims of the Ogoni people that the environment were destroyed or had been destroyed by long year oil extraction have been proven scientifically that that damage has been done. But not so much has been done with the UNEP report and the cleanup hasn't started yet. This feeds frustration among the Ogoni. I will do it. I will do it. I'll call you later. Bye-bye. Ken Jr., who works for the current democratic government in the capital, Abuja, feels obliged to continue the struggle of his father. You equally become frustrated because this is, these are my people. This is what my father died for. Um, and um, and um, you hope it doesn't go on much longer because people are getting angry and frustrated and it becomes, you know, it's almost as if we, uh, the cycle, we've almost gone full cycle again. Um, and, and, uh, and that's why, you know, for, uh, I continue within government to make to make representations on this issue, that this is important. We must raise this as a priority issue. Mosop is preparing new demonstrations in Abuja to maintain attention for Ogoniland. Piak Bara says the sentiments are still strong. Up to this moment, majority of Ogoni people still believe strongly that can set them on a path for Ogoni redemption, which they are all committed to until perhaps those issues are resolved. And also on literary level, there is activity boiling in the region. 36-year-old Obari Gomba is a Niger Delta poet publishing on Ogoniland. The title of this poem is No Leave Falls. It's a poem that I've dedicated to Ken Sarawiwa. Evergreen, no leave falls from our tall grief. We stand here as the phalanx of fame. We mull over the lessons, the lessons from your dead. You're not a saint, you're not a villain. You're just a true tragedian. Obari Gomba campaigns merely by writing. But for Ken Saru Wiwa, that was not good enough. For him, writers cannot just be apart from society, just talking about, you know, writing lovely words and things. You have, to, you have to engage with the society. You have to communicate. That's the point of writing. It's telling a story. Um, and by telling the story, you, you captivate the audience. And you move the audience to make that change. 
Obari Gomba doesn't rule out that he might also turn into activism. Yes, because if things do not change, and you keep uh, pushing, pushing that things should change, then there could come a, a time when you want to invest a greater deal of involvement to bring about change. Okay, it's difficult to sit at one point and say that you are going to live uh, in the same mode all through the rest of your life. No, there could be a point in my life, in my development as a person, when I will see the need for a large-scale mass mobilization. Meanwhile, there is progress to be reported for the Ogoni. Shell, in 2009, settled a court case pushed by a group of American lawyers by paying $15.5 million compensation to the Ogoni community. I think the settlement really it, it represented a, a victory of sorts in that um, all companies can no longer operate with the sort of impunity that they had in the past. Uh, and, you know, we owe everything to my father for that. Um, he really put the agenda of Ogoni and pollution uh, on, you know, on, on, the, on the political map. But with the UNEP recommendations unimplemented, comes the question whether Ken Sarowiwa's struggle and sacrifice made a difference. It made a difference for Ogoni, it made a difference for Niger Delta, to Nigeria, to the, the entire energy mix, you know, because it raised uh, awareness, not that it, it was the only area that was, was experiencing this kind of issue, but it just raised awareness that these, these were critical and important issues that needed, needed different approaches. Um, at that time, the, 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 you know, these were invisible minorities. You could come and drill oil in, uh, on ancestral lands. There were a few people on the lands, but they were regarded very, very much as, 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 as collateral damage or accidental to the, to the main thing, which was to extract hydrocarbons. The country had become successfully sensitized to the struggle. That's what I'm trying to say, that it was no longer an Ogoni struggle. It was both an international um, recognition and Nigeria's own uh, recognition of the, um, of the situation in Ogoni land. I think uh, my father's legacy, the, 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 the biggest difference he made was that he gave minorities in Nigeria a voice, which just hadn't happened before, you know. The country's been dominated by the three biggest ethnic groups and uh, in, they held all the political power and, uh, and everyone else was really just uh, on the margins and my, my father has changed that. It became a wake-up call to the rest of the world and to the other nationalities of the Niger Delta. It became a wake-up call. You find out that from the moment when Sarawa was executed, the Niger Delta became a global concern. Sit up, 